So now finally, let's relook at the projective uh, camera projection matrix that we have seen earlier on that uh, there are altogether 11 degrees of freedom in the projection uh, camera projection matrix, which is given by the K with five degrees of freedom from the intrinsics. This is the intrinsics. And then another three plus three equals to six degrees of freedom from the extrinsics of the camera. So now the million dollar question is that uh, since we have all together 11 unknowns that constitute this camera projection matrix, how can we find all the 11 parameters, which is uh, the 11 degrees of freedom of the camera projection matrix? The answer is uh, true calibration, and we'll look at how to do this. Besides calling this procedure as the calibration of the camera, it's also very commonly known as uh, camera resectioning. So resectioning simply means that we want to find the parameters that that uh, make up the camera projection matrix, the intrinsics, as well as the extrinsic parameters. And uh, one of the simplest approach and most commonly used approach is what we call the calibration with a 2D calibration pattern that uh, it might look like something like this with circles. But more commonly used would be the checkerboard uh, pattern. You have to physically print this out and paste it onto a flat board, well, on a, which is a plane. And we'll see why is this so. I'll be mainly describing the technique uh, written by Zhang Zhen Yu uh, in this particular paper, a flexible new technique for camera calibration that was published in TPAMI in the year 2000. So here's some open source uh, calibration toolboxes where you can download and play with it yourself. They are all mainly based on this uh, this paper that was published in TPAMI in the year 2000. So the first one is the Bouguer uh, Calibration Toolbox, commonly known as the Bouguer Calibration Toolbox because it was written by uh, Bouguer. So this was based on uh, MATLAB. And then later, some people uh, took this code and developed it into C++. And uh, I think there's also a Python uh, version right now in OpenCV. So uh, you probably can find a later version. And what I put here is uh, version 2.4, but I think now it's a probably uh, version 3. Point something already, or maybe even version 4. This particular Bouguer calibration toolbox is also migrated into the MATLAB image uh, processing toolbox. So these are free version. This is also free, but this is a paid version. Uh, because it's under MATLAB Imaging Processing Toolbox. Let's describe the actual procedure for calibration of a projective camera with the checkerboard. So given a checkerboard that looks like this, we would have to first print out the checkerboard pattern, and then we have to paste it on a flat planar board that looks something like this. So the first thing that we need to do is to assign a reference frame onto the checkerboard and we would conveniently select the assignment of this by saying that uh, we will assign the xy plane to be on the plane of this uh, checkerboard over here such that the z axis would be zero would be always the z reading of all these points on the checkerboard would be always zero Next thing is that we'll have to put this into our camera projection matrix, which is given by the equation x small x equals to p multiplied by x. And since we know that the projection is always up to a certain scale, uh, since uh, we, we have looked at earlier on s, x, s, y, and can, uh, the unknown scale here can be actually factorized out such that this becomes a normalized uh, homogeneous coordinate over here and uh, p over here would be uh, rewritten as the into this form r and t over here so essentially this is equals to p and uh, we will multiply it by the corners that we observe on the checkerboard uh, what we have seen earlier on is that the checkerboard looks something like this so this part here is shaded. And so we'll be able to detect these corners. So every corner would be represented by uh, x, y, 0, and 1. Since the world axis is conveniently attached to the checkerboard where the x, y plane is lying on the checkerboard itself. And uh, this means that all the z axis is equal to 0 here. So uh, 
that's why there's a zero here. So if we were to evaluate this, we'll see that uh, this term here on the right hand side, this multiplication uh, of the matrices and vectors over here, it ends up to be uh, this uh, equation over here, where z can be ignored because the z is going to multiply by the third column of this guy over here and hence uh, we can ignore r3 in this equation over here as well as z equals to zero over here so effectively what we get here is that we have a 2d projective mapping from the uh, checkerboard which is this is p2 and we actually get to map it into a p2 space which is on the the image so this means we are doing a mapping from a plane to a plane which simply means that the transformation operation here given by k r1 r2 and t is simply a homography which can be represented by h1 h2 h3 over here where h1 h2 h3 respectively are the uh, vectors in each uh, column of the homography matrix and we can rewrite this into uh, this form the scale homography with the unknown uh, scale factor uh, factor here is equals to k multiplied by r1 r2 and t this homography is unknown x y1 here the image coordinate this is known because given the image of the checkerboard we can actually know where are the xy coordinate of the image as well as the capital xy uh, coordinate over here because we know that we attach the world frame onto the maybe let's say the top left hand corner of the checkerboard and we know the that the checkerboard is uh, of a regular size that means that i know that each square is probably one centimeter by one centimeter so by looking at this and i also know that uh, how many square are there uh, in the checkerboard and where are the black and white boxes so what it means is that i'll be able to find the one-to-one -one correspondence of the uh, 2d coordinate point the corners matching those corners at the checkerboard in the world scene so this part here is known uh, now the only unknown would be the homography as well as the scale factor so based on the known x y in the image as well as the known x y in the world coordinate so now the objective is to find the homography as well as the unknown uh, scale factor and we can do this by looking at the equation over here that we know that uh, this s multiplied by the homography it's going to be equals to k uh, r1 r2 and t and we can simply equate this to get two independent constraints so here uh, i simply multiply s by h1 and then i bring k over so this would be equals to r1 and this would be equals to r2 although we don't know what's r1 and r2 at this moment but one thing that we know from here is that r1 r2 since it belongs to uh, the rotation matrix because this has to be r1 r2 and r3 and r1 r2 it's the first two columns of the rotation matrix and we can make use of what we have seen earlier on the octonormal constraints of the entries of the columns in the rotation matrix to get a constraint so this means that since they are both octagonal it is perpendicular to each other that means that the dot product of r1 r2 must be equals to zero so we can apply this dot product and equate it to zero what this means is that uh, this term here dot with this term here they are going to be equals to zero and hence we get the constraint over here equation one and we also know that since this is a octonormal constraint the norm of these two vectors over here r1 and r2 they should be equal hence we can write uh, the this relation over here that the dot product of this r1 over here which is equivalent to the norm of r1 it's going to be equal to the norm of r2 we'll see that in the next lecture that this term here this interesting term here is equals to the image of the absolute conic which we will call omega in the next lecture and now uh, we got two equations uh, over here which consists of all the unknowns uh, the, of the homography as well as the intrinsic uh, values let's denote this guy 
k inverse transpose and multiply by k inverse as a e matrix. It's actually a three by three matrix. And since we are multiplying it by the transpose or and taking the inverse, this means that b here is should be symmetrical as well as positive uh, definite. It should be a positive definite matrix because this can be seen as the square of a matrix. When we take a square, that means that the eigenvalues would have to be strictly uh, positive. And since uh, B is symmetrical, and we can rewrite this in terms of a 6 by 1 vector of unknowns, then uh, we will get this represented by a small b over here. So finally, we can rearrange the equations in uh, 1 and 2. If we compactly write this term k inverse transpose k um, inverse, by uh, represented by the 6 by 1 vector uh, b, we can rewrite this into a linear constraint of uh, the form of a b equals to 0. So uh, similarly here, we can also rewrite, we can bring this guy over here, and then this will be equals to this term minus this term equals to 0. We can rewrite this k inverse transpose and k inverse into the 6 by 1 vector b and then rewrite this into a linear constraint here. So if we were to stack these two equations together, we can rearrange this homography term into this form where a is made out of the homography uh, terms and b is made out of the unknowns from the intrinsic uh, values over here, which is k. a is going to be a 2 by 6 matrix because b is a 6 by 1 uh, factor and we have two equations that we have seen earlier on so altogether we will have a uh, a would have two by six entries and now this a is going to be made out of all the homography terms that we have seen earlier on in this uh, equation over here uh, it consists of h1 and h2 and b is going to be made out of all the unknown terms in the camera matrix which is a k inverse transpose and multiplied by k inverse and so what it means is that since we have six unknowns in this equation, a, b uh, equals to zero, where this has six unknowns, which one of the point correspondence here is going to give us a two by six entry in a. So altogether, since we need to solve for six unknowns, altogether we need a minimum of three different views. That means each view is going to give me h1 and h2, a homography that relates a view from the real checkerboard. So this is the checkerboard. It's mapped into the image. One view is going to give me h1 and h2. So let's denote this as uh, one. And then uh, I'm, altogether, I need three different views. I need to move either the checkerboard or the camera. I can fix the camera and then uh, take the checkerboard, just like the, what this guy is doing. He's going to move this around into a second view. So this is the second view. And then we will get another set of correspondences that relates this homography. So we have to do this uh, at least three different views. So this is the third view where I will get another homography to the image. Now, once we have this done, we will all together have a six by six A matrix multiplied by a six by one unknown uh, b and this is equals to zero the first thing that we need to do is that we need to get a in order to solve for the unknown b and what we can do here is that we know that the mapping between the checkerboard and the image is given by a homography from lecture three we know that if we have four correspondences between each view we'll be able to solve for the homography using this equation over here so we know that we have x y1 that's equals to a homography multiplied by x y1 we can ignore the scale because this is a homography is up to scale and so one view here is going to give us this correspondence and we need at least four point uh, correspondence to solve for this homography over here for each view we have four correspondences we'll be able to solve for the homography and we if we had at least three views over here we will get three sets of constraints where we can solve for three different homographies and we can plug it into this equation to get a six by six known uh, a matrix multiplied by a six by one unknown vector that this consists uh, intrinsic value k and then since we have a b equals to zero 
where A has to be 6 by 6 and then B has to be 6 by 1. So we can easily solve for the SVD of A and this is going to be U sigma V transpose. And then the solution of B is going to take the V vector that corresponds to the least singular value of this guy over here. Yeah, this is equivalent to the right now space of A. As we have also seen in the last lecture that this is essentially a least square operation when we solve for the uh, AX equals to zero, solve for the null space of B. What this means is uh, since the correspondences is corrupted with noise, A would never be exact. It's actually very noisy. So uh, if we can get more views like this, where we move, simply fix the camera and we move the uh, calibration board around. If we can get more views, it will provide a better constraint to this A, B equals to zero. And we'll be able to solve for a more accurate uh, B factor over here. So once B is recovered, we can actually uh, put it back into the capital B, which is actually a three by three matrix. So small B is actually a six by one vector which can be placed back into this symmetric uh, matrix B. And then finally, K can be uh, obtained because B here is equals to K inverse transpose inverse, which is equivalent to K transpose K inverse. We can actually take the inverse of B and then uh, take a Kolisky decomposition on B inverse to find out the values of K. So if you take a Kolisky decomposition, on a matrix A. This is equivalent to L, L uh, transpose, or the, the other way around, it doesn't matter. So this is a uh, lower triangular, or the other way around, it could be upper triangular matrix, which is equivalent to the intrinsic uh, of the camera. Once K is known, then what we are left with would be just the extrinsic uh, parameter of all views. So now it's no longer just one R and T. So if we were to take three views, that means that A is at least uh, six by six. Uh, we will have three views over here, each different view over here. There will be a different R and T. If we have a camera that stays fixed over here, that is looking at this uh, views. So view one, it will have an R and T with respect to the camera. View two will have another R and T with respect to the camera and so on and so forth. We'll also need to solve for all the extrinsic uh, parameters uh, once this is done, <clears throat> as well as the, the scale uh, factor. So let, now let's look at how to solve for all the remaining unknowns. So we seen that earlier on, R1 is equivalent to S multiplied by K inverse multiplied by H1. So H1 is in that view. So since K remains fixed for all views, it's fixed for all views. We can, and we know that this from the Kolitsky decomposition earlier on. So we can make use of this uh, values, plug it inside here. And H here would be the homography the first column of the homography that is in that particular view that corresponds to R1 and R2. For example, if I were to solve R1 here, then H would be taken from this transformation of the checkerboard onto the image itself. Then I can solve for this and R2, I can also uh, solve for this since this is known and this is known, this is known and this is known. Uh, R is R1, R2 and R3, and they are all octagonal matrices. Uh, octo this is octagonal matrix. This means that the cross product of R1, R2 will give you R3. But uh, the only unknown here, the only remaining unknown here is S, which can be easily, uh, which can be easily solved by taking the scale of the of this guy uh, over here, because we know that the norm of R1 has to be equals to one. So we can easily solve for this by taking the norm of this guy here. Uh, it has to be equals to one. Uh, and this is what we get. We can solve for S and put it back into this equation. So everything here is known. We can easily solve for R1, R2 and R3 for each respective view. And finally, the translation vector, which is also an unknown, can also be solved uh, using this form 
here. So now this is known, this is known, and this is also known. We can easily solve for the translation vector. So uh, what we have looked at so far would be how to solve for the all the 11 degrees of uh, freedom that is in the camera projection uh, metric. So there's still another set of unknowns in the camera calibration that we need to solve for. And that would be what we call the lens distortion. So usually when we take a picture using any camera, using your cell phone camera or using the DSLR or even a pocket camera, uh, we will be able to observe some form of distortion in the image. So com a more commonly observed uh, distortion would be a radial distortion. For example, if you use a highly uh, convex uh, lens, a fisheye lens, for example, then uh, even for the normal uh, camera lens, you will be able to observe some form of distortion. So there, it could be a negative radial distortion that looks something like this. All the pixels will be squashed uh, uh, towards the center. And or it could also be uh, more commonly observed, it's a positive radial distortion that looks something like this, where it's distorted with respect to the radial direction. Where the original image should look something like this, where every pixel is uh, regular. Uh, there's also another less commonly observed uh, distortion, which we call the tangential distortion. So this is more commonly occurring in cheaper cameras. Then might, it might be due to manufacturing imprecision, where let's say this is my uh, photo sensor and this is my lens that I'm going to place inside my camera. So usually uh, due to poor workmanship, we can see that the camera sensor might not be aligned in parallel with this lens. It could also be the lens that is misaligned. So in this case, we will observe uh, tangential distortion because uh, the light rays that is supposed to be focused onto this, it will be misaligned. To, to complete the camera calibration, we also have to model the lens distortion mathematically and find the parameters that uh, gives us this particular uh, model. And here uh, we will first look at how to model the radial distortion. So let x uh, equals to xy be the image projection of a 3D point without uh, distortion. This means that I'm looking at uh, this guy here uh, without any distortion. So any point here, let me represent it with xy, I suppose, which is equals to x over here. This is without any distortion. And what we need to do here is that we need to find a formulation. Let's say, for example, it's, uh, the camera has this positive radial distortion. So this is a function that takes in x here, such that it maps out to y, where this is the new position, which I call y here. And this is uh, the radially distorted pixel location. And now the question is that what is this particular function? And uh, we choose to use a parametric way of describing this function over here. So essentially, this uh, function here, which I uh, call fx earlier on, which takes in the pixel without distortion and maps it to a pixel with distortion. So fx here is essentially given by this equation that is uh, first proposed by Brown in this particular paper, Close Range Camera Calibration. And uh, we can see that the input to this would be xy, the pixel location without distortion. And there's a parameterization here where 1 plus uh, k1r square plus k2r4 uh, plus k5r6, where r here is simply the circle equation, okay, so r squared equals to x squared plus y squared. So r is actually a function, it is actually a function of x and y, which is this guy uh, over here. And then here, k1, k2, k3 is basically the radial distortion where we use to parameterize this mapping function. These are unknowns that needs to be found uh, during the calibration process. We can also model the tangential uh, distortion uh, using this particular model here that was also proposed in the same paper by Brown in 1971. So, but in comparison to uh, the radial distortion, where we find a mapping function that maps a pixel uh, without distortion onto a pixel with distortion. Here, we say that uh, we are going to find the 
uh, delta change in the pixel after the distortion. That means that uh, if I were to give you a image and then this point here, which I call X and Y, it has no uh, distortion. So in the previous case, with the after some form of uh, distortion over here, I'm going to map this and I'm uh, the mapping function that I looked at earlier on for the radial distortion is to find the exact location of this with XR with uh, radial distortion, YR with radial distortion. But now, this case here, I'm going to find the delta change uh, which adds on to the radial distortion, which I call dx over here. So uh, this essentially is also a function of x, which is my perfect uh, pixel on the image without any distortion but after mapping to here what i'm finding dx over here is essentially the new location of the pixel after i take the radial distortion into account so the final location here would be simply xr plus dx over here and dx is given by uh, this equation where r is the, still the same, r square equals to x square plus y square. And now we have two more unknowns, which we call k3 and k4. Altogether, I would have five unknown parameters, k1, k2, k5 for the radial distortion and k3, k4 for the tangential distortion. So this would be the final equation where I can uh, map a perfect pixel onto the tangentially and radially distorted image. So it will be given by this guy, which is this equation. Now, the question is that how can we find K1, K2, K3, K4, and K5? So uh, we'll use a very simple method to do this. We'll just put it through a iterative uh, refinement, a, a maximum likelihood estimation. So uh, the steps to estimate this would be uh, left to the last after we have uh, estimated the intrinsic and extrinsic cal uh, calibration using the method proposed by uh, Zhang Zhenyou that we have seen earlier on. And then uh, once we get this unknowns, the K as well as the RI and TI because of different views of the calibration toolbox, we can simply put it into this equation here this cost function here, which we call the reprojection error. So what this means is that this guy here, pi is simply the projection function. So for example, I have an image here. I have a point here where I know that this point corresponds to the checkerboard, the corner of a checkerboard, and it's being reprojected here. So let's call this point xj, and let's call this reprojected point uh, small x i j, which where j corresponds to the 3D point and i corresponds to the camera view over here. So this means that I'm reprojecting this point, which is the j point on the checkerboard, onto the, the i camera uh, view, and the correspondence will be given by x i j over here. So uh, this reprojection has to undergo p of x, which we have seen earlier on. So p here would consist of these th three sets of parameters, k, r, and t. Then, but then uh, once we use this k, p to reproject x, j back onto the image, this is on the assumption that there is a, the, the mapping is perfect. That means that there's no distortion. So what we need to do to compensate for the distortion would be simply putting this p, x, j into the distortion function that we have seen earlier on here to get the new distorted uh, location. And since there's a set of unknowns, which is consists of uh, the five parameters in K, uh, here we have an equation, it's a function of the five unknowns over here. And P here, we assume it to be known already because we would have already obtained it from the first step of the calibration. So now the question is that once we uh, reproject this, so here we can think of this as a, uh, it's actually a function of uh, pxj as well as the unknown of uh, k, uh, which is this guy over here. And then, uh, so once we reprojected based on this 
equation that consists of all the unknowns of k1 to k5. So uh, we can compare this reprojected point onto the image, the xij that we have observed on the image. Essentially, we want to minimize the square errors here. And we'll see in the lecture that uh, when we talk more about bundle adjustment, uh, how to make use of lower work marker to uh, minimize this. This is essentially a continuous unconstrained optimization, which can be done using uh, lower work marker. We'll do also a refinement over R and T uh, as well as K, and then we'll find this where we initialize it to zero. The reason why we can initialize this to zero is because these parameters are usually very small. It's close to zero. So uh, a zero initialization is actually a, a pretty good initialization in this sense. Then once we put it through, uh, we'll be able to get a new estimate of uh, all the parameters, all the intrinsic parameters, extrinsic parameters, as well as all the unknown parameters that parameterizes the radial and tangential uh, distortion here. So this uh, is also called minimizing the reprojection error because we are reprojecting the 3D points onto the 2D image. So once this point here is being reprojected here, the, the correspondence might be here. Uh, there's an error here that we want to minimize. So this is, an, in, in other words, also a geometric error that we have seen earlier on in the last lecture that this kind of error, uh, minimizing the, the geometric error, is far more accurate than what we have seen earlier on uh, using Zhang Zhenyou's method. We were solving a, b equals to zero over there. And this is actually the algebraic error. We have seen earlier on in the lecture on homography that this error is less accurate than this error. Hence, uh, by applying this minimizing the reprojection error at the last step, we are guaranteed to have a, a much more accurate results for the calibration. So uh, once we have gotten the, the calibration for the gradient and tangential distortion, we can actually do the mapping the other way around. So previously, I mentioned that there's a function here. It's essentially this direction, where any point here uh, x without any distortion, we're going to put it through f and then we will get this point here, which corresponds to the Y here, which is the distorted. So this is with distortion, and this is without any distortion. So once this is done, uh, once we know this exactly this function, we can actually compute a lookout table as mentioned before. So every pixel here, compute a lookout table that uh, look up on the corresponding uh, pixel over here, and then I can uh, simply fill this part in. Uh, so originally, we will not be able to know this. Or well, this is what we observe, but uh, we will compute for every pixel uh, here, every pixel value here. We will compute the corresponding y, and then use this as a lookup table to fill in the entries here. So eventually, we will be able to get the to recover the undistorted uh, uh, image which we call lens distortion correction. So this ends my lecture. Uh, and in summary, today we have looked at how to uh, describe the camera projection with a pinhole camera model. Uh, that's the most basic camera model that we can uh, use to describe a projection matrix. And then we also have looked at how to identify the camera center, principal planes, principal points, and principal axis from the camera projection matrix. We also look at how to use the camera projection matrix to find the forward and backward uh, projection. Then uh, next we look at the properties of and some definitions of the commonly seen uh, affine camera. Then finally, we look at a technique proposed by Zhang Zhen Yu to do calibration to find the intrinsic and extrinsic values of a projective camera. Uh, furthermore, we also look at the radial and tangential distortion and also or how to get this uh, uh, radial and tangential distortion parameters from calibration and how to undo the distortion effect. Thank you.